By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic and get ready for another sweet old school magic deck. We've got an Earn and Burn em deck by Joseph, so it's red and it's green, and that is taking on a... Well, I guess this is a Ponza Troll Disco deck by Lucas. Now, before I go to the deck decks, I would first like to mention that these decks or the two decks that are playing in the X Points Finals number 18. So this is that final, and I'm really looking forward to it because both decks seem pretty strong. So I don't actually really have a favorite looking at these, these two decks. Now, in a moment, I'm going to go over to the deck decks and discuss them all with you. But before I do that, I would first like to show you this. This is the X Points uh, point system, so the allocated point appointed uh, cards, and what that means is when you build a deck in X points, you have to make sure that your total points cannot go above the 10. So you got to check out, okay, I want to play an ancestral recall. What does that mean for my amount of points? So it's kind of like puzzling because you cannot use more than 10 points. And the cool thing is every so many months, uh, the X points come together, the community comes together, I believe mainly on Facebook and Discord, which is free for you to join, by the way. There's a link to the Facebook group in the description below. Um, and there they vote on cards that maybe need to be upgraded in points or downgraded in points, or maybe there needs to be uh, cards included in the current list. So it's a very flexible moving format. It's constantly in, in process. Now, um, before I start with the deck deck, I would also like to point out that if you want to skip this, the easiest way to do that is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, it'll take you straight to the action. And as for here, we are going to continue with the deck deck. And I'm going to start with the deck of Lucas Troll Disco Ponza. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Lucas. So this deck is combining two well-known strategies. You've got your Disco Troll combination, meaning Setch Troll and Nevenerol Disc. Nevenerol Disc, of course, can destroy everything, but you can still regenerate your creatures. So you pop the disc, you regenerate your Setch Troll, and then you start attacking with your Setch. And of course, a Nevenerol Disc goes together really well with the Mistress Factory. And the other strategy in this deck is that Ponza plan destroying a lot of lands. We see four Ice Storm, uh, we see four Sinkle and four Stone Rains. And there are also four Birds of Paradise in this deck. And that they go together really well. Because of your birds, you can play out your land destruction, hopefully a turn early. So turn two, turn three, it's full on land destruction with this deck. And then you're gonna play your really, really good creatures. Hypnotic Spectre is a creature you have to deal with as an, as an opponent. If you can't, right? you're in big trouble. And that fits together really nicely with that land destruction spell. Imagine you're playing against a red player or a player that also plays with red and you manage to kind of take out all the red lands so he doesn't have access to Bolt to take care of the hippie. That's ideal, right? The same goes for white. So you can really, with your land removal, you can target the colors that can possibly destroy your hypnotic specter. And if you've got that hippie on the board, your opponent has no answer to it, has a mana problem, hopefully, then you can start discarding his hand and make it super painful. And then as a backup plan, you've got these Nevenerals discs right you can always pop a disc so I mean this is looking quite good at first glance you may think birds of paradise and Evanerals disc isn't that kind of a non bow well you don't need the birds later in the game the birds is a tempo play so you know and the disc is more a control play so later in the game when you're behind for whatever reason you know you can pop the disc and you can start rebuilding again so I'm, I'm really I'm really liking this it, it's just looking like a really strong deck because it's using two well-known strategies, two proven strategies, and it puts them together. So I'm not surprised that Lucas, his deck has made it here into the finals. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Joseph's um, Urnum Burnum. Let's take a look. And here we see the deck of Joseph. So the deck is called Library, Please Find Me Some Bolts, which is pretty cool because we see, of course, the uh, Library of Alexandria and Library also referring to, you know, your library, your, your deck. So it makes sense. We see a lot of bolts in here in the form of four chain lightnings and four lightning bolts. For me, whenever I see, of course, Urnums and Burn, I'm going to Urn and Burn a mode. There is no Fireball in your deal and also no uh, Channel. So, I mean, I think it's kind of refreshing to see somebody not playing Channel Fireball in a red-green combination. Although it's also always kind of fun to play Channel Fireball. But, I mean, let me know in the comments what do you think. But uh, by, by leaving those two cards out, he has made some more space for other cards. Uh, the first thing I really notice in this brew is that he's playing with four Berserks. Now, usually when I play with Berserks, I tend to just play with three, sometimes even two, but he's really going full on that plan, right? We also see Bloodlust. Of course, Bloodlust and Berserk go together quite well. Uh, Giant Grove Berserk goes together quite well. The Urnum, of course, having four power by itself, you know, with an uh, Berserk already makes, uh, means eight Trample power going 
at your opponent, so that works quite well. So I, I, I kind of like it here that, uh, you know, that Joseph's like, okay, you know, my deck just wants to hurt my opponent as fast as I can. So I'm just gonna play with four Berserks, I don't care. And in this specific matchup, I think one of the things that really speaks uh, in favor of Joseph here is the fact that he doesn't need that much mana actually for this deck to work. Yes, Urnim is kind of costly, but if you ignore the Urnim in this build, everything is like one mana, two mana. Uh, you only have your Wheel of Fortune that's a little bit more expensive. So that could be a problem for Lucas here because, you know, Joseph's like, oh, you're taking care of land. I don't really care. I only need two mana anyway to be fully operational. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how that works. Let me know in the comments below who your favorite is. Do you like this Joseph's deck library? Please find me some bolts. Or is your favorite the uh, Ponza Troll Disco deck? by Lucas. Let me know in the comments below before we jump into the match. Remember, this is finals number 18. And again, if you want to join the X Points community, it's super simple. Check out the description below and there you will find a link to their Facebook group. It is all free to join. So if you like the format, join in and every month you can play some old school magic. For now, let's go to the finals. Number 18, Lucas versus Joseph. Game number one, and as you can see, they've already had their first turns. There were some technical difficulties. You can see the screen is frozen at the moment. Uh, don't worry, this is only the beginning of the video. The rest <laughs> is better, just bear with me. But I wanted to show you kind of the start. So we see that Lucas, the player on the right with the Disco Ponza deck has started with the City of Brass into a Birds of Paradise, which is what he wants. And we see Joseph here taking his turn one. He's tapping that forest. He wants to do something. It's probably going to be a Lana or Elf, right? That's uh, that's the most uh, logical first turn play when he just uh, plays a green. He also plays with Curd Apes, of course, so that's also an option. And um, they're right now restarting their screen, so they should be back any moment. But I, I just wanted to show you this. And Lucas, by the way, also took a Mulligan. So he started with a card less, and he's on the play. So I, when I'm taking a Mulligan, personally... I always hope that I'm kind of on the draw, that I can still draw that card number seven. But you know me, I'm a blue player, so I always want to draw cards. One of the problems of blue players. Anyway, um, yeah, let's, let's just wait until the screen comes back. And we are back, but it looks like we've missed quite a lot. Now, don't worry, this is the only like glitch in the video. The rest is all smooth sailing, but it looks like we've missed a turn two of both of these players. So turn one, Joseph probably played a script sprites and then Lucas played out some land removal on that forest and he played a uh, Birds of Paradise. So that's probably a sinkhole. Could that be a sinkhole? Anyway, then he passed the turn to Joseph and Joseph played a Curd Ape. So now he's in his third turn and uh, it looks like he's about to attack. There's a City of Brass from Joseph. Unfortunately, not a forest or else the Curd Ape would have gotten a nice bonus. So now it's still a 1-1 attacking with both his small creatures, putting Lucas on 16, it seems. Oh, he wants to do something. Tapping the City of Brass. Are we going to see a giant growth here? And if so, on what creature? I guess on the Curd Ape. That would make most sense. Let's first wait and see. Yeah, there's the Giant Growth on the Curd Ape, making it a 4-4. Now, of course, Lucas can respond. Does he have a Bolt? Oh, there's the Bolt. That is devastating here for Joseph. Losing the Curd Ape. This is a very good 2-for-1 for, for Lucas. That's, of course, the risk that Joseph is taking. But, I mean, his deck's aggressive. This is what he wants to do. So, I do get the... Uh, I do understand... The decision that he made and Lucas here uh, drawing a card for turn taking a damage from his own city going to 15 okay there's a stone rain probably on the city of brass I mean you could also consider going for the mountain and kind of forcing Joseph to take damage but I think I would go for the city here because you cut off uh, the color green here for Joseph Joseph responding with a bolt on one of the birds I think that's a good decision because Lucas is having some land issues He's just not finding any, it seems, being stuck on his, just his one lander. There's the attack with the sprites, putting Lucas on 14, and there's some more pressure in the form of a Curd Ape, but also Joseph missing his land drop here in the past turn. Three cards in hand for Lucas. Lucas just passing, doing nothing. This is ideal for Joseph. If he can find a forest, that Curd Ape becomes a 2-3. That would be ideal for Joseph here in this scenario. Attacking with both, two one ones. Lucas dropping to 12, so almost halfway his life total. There's a Chain Lightning. Is he going to play it on the birds? Yeah, I think that's a good decision. So playing it on the bird. 
Oh, he's sending it back. Of course he can do that. He can send back the chain by paying two red. So tapping the bird and the city of brass, sending back the chain, killing the curd ape. I do think it's a good decision by Joseph, though. Because the Lucas is, is so low on mana and he needs some more mana. I mean, one mana is not going to cut it for Lucas here. There's an attack with the sprites. So Lucas on 10 and just the top deck and a pass from, uh, from Lucas here in Joseph's turn again. So Joseph has an opening, but Joseph also cannot find any more land. So both players are kind of stuck. Okay, there's a Hammerheim. I'm sure if you're Joseph, you would have loved a green source. Okay, there's a duel for Lucas. So he's got access to black and green. And of course, that City of Brass can make red. Knowing Lucas's deck, he wants to go to three because that gives him access to Hypnotic Spectre and Setch Troll. Okay, this is good. Mishra's Factory going to seven. There's the hippie. Are we going to see a bolt by Joseph? Tapping a red here. Yep, there's a bolt on a hippie. Another added problem for Joseph, though, is that uh, Mishra's Factory on the side of Lucas. There's an attack putting Lucas on six and passing the turn. Tapping again. But Lucas is on 5 now, taking a lot of damage from his own City of Brass. He's on 5. There's a Taiga! I mean, Joseph is close, but it looks like Lucas is now stabilizing. So are we going to see a change here? There's the attack. Is he going to block? I think he kind of has to block, actually. It's too big of a risk. Remember, Lucas is playing Giant Grove. Lucas is playing Bloodlust. Okay, there we see a Giant Grove. But, I mean, if you're Lucas, you have to do it. He's on five. And this is exactly what Joseph wants, kind of forcing Lucas in this position where he has to make these blocks. Tapping again. Ooh, he's going to drop to four. An Ice Storm taking care of the Taiga. But he is dropping to four. He's going to take at least one more from the Script Sprites. There's the attack. Going to go to three. Is he going to finish it? Bloodlust. That's game. Wow. I have to say, I kind of, it's like a sprint, right? It's, um, I kind of enjoy watching it. Both players having mana problems, which makes sense if you're Joseph because Lucas is playing land destruction. But um, yeah, if you're playing, if you're uh, Lucas, it was a bit more surprising. He just couldn't find any land in that game number one. Now, both players are going to shuffle up and, uh, and dig, dive into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game uh, number two. Game number two, here we go. So it's a best of three. We have uh, one game up for Joseph and he's taken a mulligan here. It's Lucas on the play, of course, after losing that first game. So he's on the uh, Ponza Disco deck and Joseph on the Earn and Burnham strategy. Lucas starting here with the Badlands and passing the turn. There we see a Pendlehaven, which is quite good in the deck of Joseph. Tapping for one green. Are we going to see another Script Sprites? There it is. So that's some early damage. No bolt from Lucas. Also playing with chains, of course. Are we going to see a chain? No, we're going to see some land removal. That Pendlehaven is a goner. Sinkhole. Lucas, of course, having tons of land removal. Four Sinkhole, four Stone Rain, four Ice Storm. It's, uh, it's pretty brutal. Let's see what Joseph can do. Another land. Tapping a green. And there is a lot of elves and an attack putting Lucas on 19. If Joseph can win this, he is the winner of number 18. So Lucas is under some pressure here. There is a Mishra's Factory tapping three, a Stone Rain, more land removal. Luckily for Joseph, he was able to cast a Lana Elves, untapping the sprites. I wonder if he's got another land. Remember, he did take a mulligan, so he started with one card less. Perhaps he took a mulligan because he only had one land in hand, for example, knowing now that Lucas is heavy on the land destruction plan. Looks like he's going to drop another one. There's a City of Brass tapping the city. He's going to take a damage, going to go to 19. What is he going to do with the mana? There is a Curd Ape. And again, he doesn't have a forest to power up the ape. Attacking for two, of course. So Lucas dropping to 17. It's going very slow, though, for Joseph. He is dealing damage every turn, but I'm sure he wants it to go a lot faster. And Lucas now having that assembly worker to block with the coming turn. Or is he going to play some more land removal? Oh, there's a strip mine. That'll do it. Stripping it. So there are 13 land destruction spells if you count that strip mine. And why shouldn't you? That's just insane. At least Joseph, like I said in the deck deck, Joseph doesn't need a lot of mana, right? I mean, he needs... 
one, two mana would be ideal for him. Okay, there's a Taiga powering up the Curdate, making the Curdate a 2 3. And he is gonna attack. Does that mean that he's got like a Giant Grove or a Bolt? It looks like he's changing his mind though. He could, of course, bluff as well. Is he going to do that? It looks like he's not. He's just going to attack with the flyer, it seems. Joseph putting the flyer sideways. Putting Lucas here on 16, it seems. Or are we going to see a bolt on the flyer? Nope, he's going to go on 16. And is Joseph going to do something else second main? There is a scavenger folk. And I'm now already thinking, was it wise for Joseph to play this Taiga if he wasn't going to attack with the Curd Ape? Because now he's giving Lucas the opportunity to destroy that land. And, you know, Joseph doesn't have too many, uh, too many lands in hand or too many cards in hand anymore. So here we see a lot of chatting, by the way, on the right. It's a, <laughs> it's a pretty active community. But we can just ignore that. Um, so Lucas having four cards. Joseph seeing really in the tank here in his second main. And he's going to tap here to Taiga. What's he going to do? There's a chain. Putting Lucas here on 13. I think this is a good decision from Joseph to kind of use that rat mana. Because the chance is pretty big that Lucas is able to remove the Taiga now. There is a Batlands. Are we going to see an Ice Storm or a Stone Rain? Oh, an Hypnotic Spectre. That is interesting, and he's stepping his uh, factory. So this is interesting for Joseph. He can now attack with the Curd Ape, which is a 2-3. And if he's got a Giant Grove, for example. Oh, Pendle even, even better. And what a luxury for Joseph and all that mana. He can now just attack with everything, basically. Pendlehaven giving a 1-1 one, one creature plus 1 plus 2. That is a big problem. For Lucas. And look at Joseph go. Of course, this is what he has to do. He is the aggressor. He's got the most aggressive deck. He has to do this. And Lucas is a little bit more on the control strategy, you could say. So Joseph attacking here. I think it's a, it's a good move. I wonder if Lucas has a bolt in hand. If he doesn't block, he's going to take six points of damage. That means he would drop to seven. It looks like he's not blocking. Pendlehaven being used. Oh, or is he going to play a Bloodlust instead? And it's very important for Joseph here, of course, to really communicate. Okay, do you have no blocks? I have no blocks. Then play the Bloodlust. So he's playing the Bloodlust. I'm not quite sure on what creature. Okay, he's putting it on there. That's great, Joseph. Let's make it clear on what creature you're, you're playing at. He's putting it. On the scavenger folk, dealing five points of damage extra, so that's six, seven, nine points of damage. Lucas dropping to four here. Is this the end of the road for Lucas? Is he gonna lose this one? And is Joseph taking the, fi the, the victory here? Remember, it is a best of three. Is Joseph with his earn and burn him strategy? Is he gonna win? X points number 18. And yes, there are a lot of tiny creatures. And for Lucas, this is tough. I think what, what, if you're Lucas, if at least you've got like one bolt, that would help. Remember, if he animates the, the factory next turn, Joseph can use the scavenger folk to destroy the factory. So it's really tough. I think if you're Lucas, you don't want to attack with the Hippie. That's kind of obvious. Four creatures and, of course, that Pendlehaven. There is a City of Brass. Ooh, you know, is he gonna, he's going to tap the City. C-O-P Red. Okay, that is interesting. But I don't think it's enough to save him, though. So Joseph uh, kind of forgetting to untap his army here. Exactly, now he's untapping. This is going to be a very interesting turn. Very interesting. And also for Joseph, it's going to be quite tough to kind of decide what to do. So we do see the Curd Ape that he can stop with the COP Red. Right? He probably wants to keep the Scavenger Folk home. 
in case of an animate, or maybe he doesn't because Lucas is so low on life. If he attacks with four, interesting. Is he just gonna attack with the script sprites? Also attacking with the Llanowar Elves and with the Scavenger Folk? Or is he? It looks like he's still kind of in the tank. I'm wondering, should you go all out here? Because he's got two blockers and he can stop one with the COP. So he's again going to stop the Kurt Ape. I would keep the scavenger home. Again, it's easy for me now to look at this, right? From this viewpoint. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but I would keep the scavenger folk home and attack with the other three creatures. That's what I would do. Because then you've got your Pendle Haven to pump the script sprites if Lucas blocks it on the hippie. You can use your scavenger folk to destroy the factory before blockers are declared. And then, yes, Lucas is going to survive one more turn, but then he's on... I mean, he's going to be on one or something or two. So he's attacking with these three. And there we see him animate the factory. I wonder if Joseph has a giant growth or a bolt perhaps for the factory. Only one card in hand it seems for Joseph. This is very decisive, this moment in the game. He's going to use the Pendle Haven on the script sprite. So Luke is blocking the script sprite with the Hypnotic Spectre. He's going to take two points of damage. And we can see that the uh, scavenger folk is dead and passing the turn. Yeah, like I said, I think, again, it's easy from my perspective, right? So no, no bad comments uh, towards the players. But I believe an attack just with everything except scavenger would have been a little bit better in this case. And look at Lucas Goyer playing a second Mishra's Factory. Wow. A falling star. Oh, wow. A falling star. This is big. So Falling Star, if you flip it, it deals three damage to each creature it hits. And how it works in old school, you got to flip it from one foot, right? And you can put the creatures together, but they cannot overlap. So this is going to be such an important flip here for Lucas. And this, this Falling Star can get him back into the game. Of course, he's still on two against a deck that has bolts. You know, he's not there, but man, this is exciting stuff. So Lucas is going to get ready for the flip. Oh man, this is such an important flip. The finals, number 18 of X-Points. Lucas is going to go for the flip. Ay, 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 ay. There he goes. Of course, taking his time. There's a flip. Oh, it's a full hit. All three creatures are gone. They're dead. And now Lucas can start even attacking with the factory this turn. Oh, but he's untapping instead. I think, Lucas, you could have attacked man with the factory. Get two damage in here. Wow. And then Joseph playing a, a factory. I think if you're Joseph, you're like, I'm still pretty high up on life. I think he's on 19 or something. And he's just going to wait for the bolt. But look at Lucas here playing another factory. So he can play the factory beatdown plan. Gonna attack with the factory now, can pump him to a 4-4. So Lucas is probably just gonna take the damage here. It's kinda hard to see Lucas's life total, by the way. Cause that's a little small, eeny weeny tiny dice. And look at that, Lucas not pumping, just dealing two points of damage. Of course, he wants to keep his blockers there. That makes absolute sense for Lucas. He is on two, passing the turn here to Joseph. But what a flip that was with the Falling Star, and that, that's really bringing Lucas back into this game. Yes, he's on two, but if he can put enough pressure on. And I believe Joseph is on 17 right now. It's, it, as I said, it's kind of hard because, you know, you can't really see that life total there, but I believe he's on 17. There's a strip mine. That is pretty big. He can strip a factory. Then in response, of course, Lucas can animate the other factory and pump the factory with the factory he's stripping. So there are some possibilities.
And Joseph, of course, now doubting what to do. I mean, this is what makes factories so interesting. Yes, they're very dominant in old school, but what I like about them is, is this, these kind of plays, you know, if you, if you take care of a factory in response, you can animate, you can pump the other one. If you've got multiple factories, if you have a factory with, with summoning sickness, you know, it cannot pump itself. So there are all these things. And again, you know, factory is one of the only creatures. It almost has hex proof, you know, cause you can decide when, when to make it vulnerable, right? If you make it into a creature, an artifact creature, no less, it is super vulnerable. And here we see Joseph using the strip mine, taking care of one of the factories and passing the turn. Lucas now two cards in hand. And I mean, he's got the land destruction deck. I'm sure he's going to find some more land removal, taking care of that one factory on the side of Joseph. And then he can start attacking again. For Lucas now, it's super important that he, that he attacks very, very quickly. I'm hoping on a third game here that he attacks super quickly. He doesn't give Joseph the chance to get back into this. There we see a stone rain. Probably on the factory so that he can attack exactly on the factory. He's going to attack for two, and I believe that means that Joseph is going to drop to 15. I'm not 100% right. Uh, uh, I'm not 100% sure, I mean. But he's got to be somewhere around the 15. So Joseph still has tons of life. But next turn, Lucas can potentially attack for four, put him on 11. Look at that, just a pass from Joseph. Are we going to see a turnaround here? Is Lucas going to take this game, steal this game from Joseph and put it on to 1-1. There's another attack. I believe he's on 13, playing a Setch Troll and passing the turn. Setch Troll now, of course, a 3-3 because of the Badlands and the Bayou. So that's even more damage. He can deal 7 points of damage. That is really big. I believe Joseph is on 13, perhaps even lower. If he can then attack for seven, he can have more than half Joseph's life total. And the next turn, he is dead. So Joseph needs to find that bolt or that chain lightning. Remember the title of his deck. Library, please give me some bolts. And that's exactly what Joseph is praying for right now. Give me some bolts. So Joseph really taking the time, knowing in what a difficult spot he is in. Passing the turn, three cards in hand. I mean, for Lucas, this is pretty simple. Attack for seven, right? Unless you've got land removal, maybe. Animating the factories, exactly, attacking for seven here. He's going to swing in. Are we going to see some action on the side of Joseph? I don't think so. Right, because in this case, if he would have a bolt, he would play it on Lucas's life, of course. Can he have anything to kind of prevent this damage? He could play a Berserk, for example, on one of the, the factories. But I mean, that would also double the damage. That's just not ideal. So I believe he's on 13. He would take 7. He would drop to 6. Again, it's impossible to see when we're looking at that white dice there. So it's really impossible to know his life. I guess as long as the players know. And it looks like he's on a single digit now. So I think he's on six or five, perhaps. I mean, you know, Joseph, you got to do something now, man. Are you going to lose this game? There's a city of brass. Is he going to tap? Does he have the bolt? Tapping the taiga. There's a lot of elves. Okay, he can pump it to a 2-3. That can buy him one more turn. You know, he's got one blocker. He could buy him a turn. He's asking about the library here of Lucas. And passing the turn. So, interesting.
I mean, if you're Lucas, you can just simply decide to animate one factory, attack with the factory and attack with the Sedge. And you can pump up the other factory if he blocks. Now, he doesn't do it, so does that mean he's got uh, a play second main? Just attacking with the Sedge. I wonder, I mean, if you're Joseph, maybe he's going to take the damage? Then again, if Lucas then has a bolt or a chain, he's going to die, so... I believe he's on six, so if he would take the damage, he would go on three. He's taking the damage. That kind of makes sense. His, back's, his back is against the wall. Tapping four here. There's a disintegrate. That's it. The end of the road here for Joseph, at least for this game. It is a 1-1. One, one. And man, Lucas, that flip of Falling Star, it was amazing. Anyway, both players are now going to shuffle up and we're going to get a game number three right here in the finals of X Points 18. Game number three, the deciding game. Who's going to crown himself X Points champion? And we see Lucas here taking a mulligan on that decisive game. He is on the draw. So is it going to be Lucas or is it going to be Joseph? There we see a library of Alexandria. That is great for Joseph. But of course, Lu oh, there's a strip mine. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say Lucas playing with tons of land removal, but strip line is the best answer to the Loa. And of course, Joseph probably hoping that Lucas would need one more turn before he could start his land removal engine. There we see a Lunderer Elf. I mean, on the bright side for Joseph, it does mean that Lucas can probably exactly not remove a land now, so giving Joseph a little bit of breathing space here. And he can now, uh, if he has another land... He has got three mana, which is a lot when you're playing against Lucas. I wonder if Joseph can, for example, find a Sylvan. That would also be really good for him. Is Joseph going to find a Curdape? Taika Curdape, of course, a classic combination. I mean, when I started playing in Revised, there were so many Taika Curdape decks. It was the number one play to make. Looks like he's attacking Lucas. Going to go down to 19. A Whirling Dervish, a card from the sideboard. So it's a 1-1 one, one creature with protection from black. And every time it deals damage, it gets a plus one, plus one counter. Well, damage to the opponent, that is. So if you block it, it doesn't get the bonus. Earthquake for one. Ho, ho. That is deadly. I believe also a card from the sideboard. Killing both creatures here of Joseph. Putting him back to square one. This is a brilliant play by Lucas. A really good two for one for him and also buying him some time. I think the longer the game takes, the more chance Lucas has of winning. Those set trolls are really difficult for Joseph to deal with. There we see a scavenger folk. Three cards in hand and a pass. We haven't seen a single Urnum Jin, by the way, from, uh, from Joseph. Perhaps he boarded those out. It's actually nice, a little request from me to the players. If you want to, please let me know in the comments below how you board it. It's always really interesting to know that. You can just leave a comment under this video and I will pin it. And we can all see how you board it. Anyway, there's a Hypnotic Spectre from Lucas. Does Joseph have an answer for the Spectre? A Bolt would be great, of course. He could then Bolt the Hippie. Attack for one, perhaps put another creature on, uh, on the board. He is going to, if he's going to attack, he's, you know, I mean, if you're Lucas, you're probably just going to take the damage. You don't want to run into a giant growth. Looks like he's tapping the Taiga first, though. Untapping again. And it's understandable here that uh, Joseph is really taking his time. This is game number three. This is, this is the moment. The moment of the moment in the finals, right? It's 1-1. One, one. This is the game that counts. That's going to decide if you're a runner-up or a winner. And Joseph really being in the tank here. I wonder if he's doubting, should I play my bolt now? Or maybe it's a chain, or should I first attack? Yeah, there's a chain lightning taking care of the hypnotic specter. And then there's the attack for one, putting Lucas on 16. Now 
No damage taken by uh, Joseph yet. He's still on 20. Two cards in hand, it seems, for Joseph and a pass turn. And Lucas drawing some cards. I mean, there's another factory. If he wants to, he can attack, of course, with the factory. But, you know, land removal would be quite nice as well. He does neither. Passes the turn. Four cards in hand. I wonder what those cards could be. I mean, if he would have had a set stroll, he would have played it out because he can play it out and keep a mana open for regeneration. A hippie, also he can play land removal, he would have played, so maybe he's kind of land flooded. There's the attack with the scavenger, so kind of signaling to Lucas that he's got a giant growth in hand or maybe a bloodlust or something. I wonder if you're Lucas, maybe you just want to, would you want to block this? Yeah, he's animating and saying, you know what, if you've got it, show it to me. Remember, you can also pump it and make it a 4-4 with the other one. So pump it to 4-2-3-3 three, three, and then destroy it. There is a giant grove, so he can actually trade here. Which is not too bad for Lucas, you know. It is kind of a 2-for-1 trade. Which is not the end of the world. So it can pump itself, if I'm correct, making it a 3-3. Three, three, pump it with the other one, make it a 4-4 four, four, and have a trade here. That's exactly what's happening. I wonder if Joseph also has a Berserk. That way he can deal four more points. There's the Berserk. Okay, so dealing four more points of damage, but he is going to lose a lot of cards, though. There's the Bolt. But that Bolt is being played after the Giant Grove. If Lucas wanted to play the Bolt in response to the Grove, he should have done it earlier, if I'm not mistaken. Then again, of course, the players are talking to each other. I cannot hear that. I do not have the audio. So this is going to be interesting. Okay, so... Yeah, Lucas is saying I'm taking the Bolt back in that case, or I'm Bolting in response to the Grove. I mean, he could if he wants to bolt in response to growth, but he's kind of missed that opportunity. Of course, it's up to the players always to kind of decide how to do this. And the atmosphere in, in old school is, is pretty friendly, you know, in general. And yeah, we see some comments from the side that makes sense, right? You play your giant growth, giant growth results. After that, you play your berserk. Exactly, and then it's kind of too late. I think it's still a good deal for Lucas, though. Another Berserk. Ooh, now it gets interesting. So that's eight. That's 16 points of damage. Of course, he is blocking with a 4-4. Four, four. Ooh, so he's taking 12 points of damage. He's going to drop to 12, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, he's going to drop to 3. He's going to take 12 damage. Wow, that is huge. That is huge. But Joseph now only having one card left. Remember, um, he is still on, on 20 though. But Lucas is under pressure here. So Joseph on 20, Lucas on 3. Somebody in the comments is saying he's, he's on 4. Of course, because he took the City of Brass damage earlier from the Bolt, so he is on 4. That actually makes a big uh, difference, because that means he's out of Bolt range. There we see an animate and an attack for 2, so Joseph's going to drop to 18. And then we're going to see a pass. So, I mean, if Joseph can now find like a Wheel of Fortune, that would be ideal. Okay, there's a Curd Ape. That's actually pretty good, because the Curd Ape stops... The factory, there's a bolt on the ape though. We saw that bolt before. So bolt on the ape. Ape is a gunner. There's an attack for two. So Joseph gonna drop to 16. I mean, Lucas is not out of this. I mean, he's alive. Four is enough. And four, you know, he can take a bolt. There is a lot of elves in the pass. I wonder if Joseph has an Urnum in hand. He could now cast it. 
Again, I don't know how Joseph sideboarded. Perhaps he boarded out the Urnums. Tapping a green, another Lanawer Elves. One card in hand for Joseph and a pass. I mean, if he's got a Bloodlust in hand, for example, Joseph could next turn attack with Bova, both Lanawers and the one that comes through, you could put a Bloodlust on there. Taking, of course, the risk that if Lucas has another Bolt, he's losing both of his creatures. But if he doesn't, he's going to win. It looks like he's going to tap three. Falling Star again. Wow. So many Falling Star action. I love it. And we've seen how well Lucas can flip with the star. He hit three targets. Now he only has to hit two targets. Wow. This is bad news here for Joseph. And there's the flip. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful flip by Lucas killing both Lanawer Elves. Wow, that's really good, Lucas, here. There we see a script sprites. Okay, that has flying. It can fly over the factory workers, and it can deal some damage. Lucas on four, Joseph on 16. I believe four cards in hand, or, or three? No, I believe four cards in hand for Lucas. Attacking for two. No, he's not. He's going to play something. City of Brass taking damage. He's going to go down to three. This is risky. Then again, I understand this play because if he doesn't play it out, he's going to go to three anyway because he cannot block the script sprites. But now he's in bolt range. If Joseph can find a bolt or a chain lightning, he's won the game. There is a factory worker. Mishra's factory. One card in hand for Joseph. Oh, man. This is, this is nerve-wracking, you know? This is the kind of magic I love when both decks are, are so equal to one another. And we're here in game number three. There's an attack with the Hypnotic Spectre. Does that mean that Lucas has another hippie in hand, perhaps? Got to discard a land. He's going to take two. He's going to drop to 14. There's a Bayou. I am expecting him to play another blocker. Is he going to play another Hypnotic Spectre? That would be... Really bad for Joseph. There's a Setch Troll. I mean, I guess this makes sense in a way. If you're, if you're Lucas, you're, you're right. It doesn't matter if I'm on, you know, two or if I'm on zero. Then again, you are taking a risk. If Joseph now has, for example, a Giant Growth or a Bloodlust, he can win it here. So he actually has quite a lot of cards that can give him the victory. A Bolt, a Chain, a Giant Grove, a Bloodlust. All those cards can grant him the victory. Unless, of course, you know, Lucas has a Bolt in hand. Is Joseph going to play something here? Does he have it? Tension, tension, tension. Lucas also waiting for the play by his opponent. Joseph declared the attack. Looks like he's thinking about also attacking maybe with the Mishra's factory. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. But then again, I don't know what's in his hand. He's going to drop to two. We don't see any giant growth for bloodlust and a pass turn. I mean, this is risky, right, from Lucas. Now, Lucas is going to attack for five. Ooh, it is very gutsy. Attacking for five points. So he's going to put Lucas on 11. And of course, he's going to lose the card. Just the City of Brass. Tapping three more. There's another Setch Troll. Ooh, this is a lot of pressure. Wow, 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 wow. Joseph again being so close. Remember game two when he was also so close and still he lost. I mean, he's, he's looking at 10 points of damage next turn. Well, I mean, if he attacks with the factory, Joseph can block with the factory. So I think it's eight points of damage. 
Just one card in hand. Again, Joseph passing the turn. This time, choosing to keep the script sprites untapped. There's a sinkhole. Yeah, gonna go on the factory. That makes sense because that means he can also attack with his own factory, putting even more pressure on the life total of Lucas. Animating the factory. Gonna swing in for 10 points. That would mean if Joseph doesn't block, he's gonna drop to, I believe, three. If I'm not mistaken, I could be mistaken, of course, with the life total. Perhaps he's a bit lower, but I think he can still survive one more swing. He is gonna block a set troll, it seems. And then he's still gonna take seven points of damage, meaning he would go to six. Losing a card as well. Oh man, it's looking so bad. Joseph is in top decking mode. He's got one last turn. Kurt Ape, that's it. Lucas, you've won it. Congratulations. X points number 18. And uh, man, whew, gotta take a breather here. That was, that. these were some close and intense matches. And, and Joseph, man, I feel for you. You were so close. That's what I love about, you know, the aggro decks is that they're always so close. It's, it's like a sprint, but sometimes the game ends up in the marathon and you just cannot make it. Lucas, congratulations for winning. Here we see his winning deck, the winner of X Points 18. And I would also like to thank all of you for watching another video right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And before you go, I would like to ask you to do a few things. First of all, if you're new to the channel, welcome to Old School. I'm sure you love it after watching this video. Please subscribe to Timmy Talks because that helps the channel. And I make uh, two videos a week. So if you want to stay up to date on everything Old School, subscribe to Timmy Talks. And um, then if you're a regular, thank you for coming back. Please like this video, that really helps. Leave a comment and share it on your socials. All these things are free and they really help Timmy Talks move forward because YouTube loves that stuff. So please, please do me a favor. Click that, hit that like button and leave a comment. And uh, one last thing that I wanna point out and, and then you're free to go, then you're free to go. Um, <laughs> Sorry guys, getting here. But the last thing I want to point out is that I also have my own Patreon page. So you can become a patron of Timmy Talk. So if you love what I do, consider supporting me. It already starts with $1 a month. And for that $1, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord, all the Timmy tournaments that I organize for channel members and patrons to thank them for their support. So you could be part of that. And also your name will be mentioned at the end of every video in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll.